So I start, and for ending this session, uh, the three of us, actually the two of us and a, a, a plus one, uh, decided to do a presentation. Um, and this will be our last presentation for today, and then we can start some discussion. Uh, the, can I start? Yeah. Okay. The presentation we bring here today is focused on one single book. This was not written as a book, but it was published by chapters in a juvenile journal, and until today, it is considered to be a children's book, although it is clearly, as you will see, so much more than that. The first publication occurred in 1933, and it was compiled into a book more than three dec decades later. However, its free circulation only occurred after the end of the dictatorship in 1974, when censorship could not control the mind and creativity of Potter's writings and Portuguese artists. Its author was José Gomes Freire. Inés is going to speak a little bit more about him, but he died in the mid 1980s. No point in telling you that all the, all the story of his life, but he was a Republican, a man, a man that despised the regime, something we can observe in his writing. The main character of the book is João, a young boy, although we never discover his age. He still lives with his mother in a tall cult, and I translate literally, cry and you will drink. Well, the people of cry and you will drink were professional weepers, and they cried so much that they had moss, green moss, around their eyes and mouths. They were always in fear of something and always complaining and always hoping for the next meal of boiled cod fish with turnip greens. What we love about this book is that the second main character is not someone but a wall. And the wall represents all the mental barriers that people in that small village had to a point that when he decides to leave, cry a new will drink, and walks towards the wall, he finds this message written, written, uh, written on it. It was on purpose that we did not translate it, because for me, Tanya, it means the passage is not allowed for those who are not overwhelmed with life. But it seems that this can be translated in other ways. What is your translation? I think it is, the, it is, not, it is not permitted to people who are not surprised by it. Existing. And you? <laughs> uh, just like, uh, I understand that you know, the passage has a, a creativity to it, but in, in English, if you don't have creativity, you, you cannot cross the wall. And I, and I read that and after crossing the wall, you see a lot of creativity stuff. And that's why it is very okay. But John crosses the wall and initiates a quest for something that not even he knows what it is. As any traditional story goes, the first stage is a choice between two paths, the easy one and the difficult one, where he even meets a fairy. A difficult choice is made and Drone chooses the difficult path and initiates a journey that will transform him into a tree, take him to a castle in the sky, a land of flying gramophones, a city turned upside down where its inhabitants walk with their hands and, with their hands and play, planes travel on the ground. He meets tyrants that imprison and enslave their people and friends that help him to overcome difficulties and others to whom he offers his help. He almost loses his life at least three times while meeting giants, crossing deserts or running away from soldiers. He even meets different versions of himself. He meets a always in fear John and he meets someone that he doesn't know who he is because they look so alike that at a point they don't know which, which one is it. The time of the journey is not known, but we can calculate a few years because uh, seasons pass. We have autumn and spring and summer again. After covering a large portion of the known world, his main desire is to get back to the wall and cross it again to the other side, returning to his mother and to cry and he will drink, where after an attempt to change the mind of his people, he gives up and goes home to eat boiled fish with turmeric greens. Yet, he decided to do something different, a little bit more creative. And while everyone else cries, he's open, uh, he, he will open a Kleenex factory. So the book, we must say, was a, a success and it has inspired many generations creating illustrations and theater representations still. The first time I read it, I was 12 years old, many decades ago. 
Since then, it was a regular reading and a book I recommended to many of my friends, especially because it's just, it, this is so much more than a tale about an adventurous and fearless boy. It is a critical reading of a social organization where the three of us were born and raised. And learn how to be archaeologists. So, yes. Okay, so, about the 1930s. The 1930s came before one of the bloodiest times in world history. This is a time that if it was rise to power took places, this is the time that the Second World War breaks out. People and the world, the whole world watches helplessly the genocide in Nazi concentration camps and the mass arrest of the Gulag in the Soviet Union. The New York Stock Exchange crashed in 1929 and totalitarian movements break out all over Europe. So, our work was written in 1933 when Portugal gained a new constitution and with it a dictatorial regime. So, with the development of industrialization and the centralization of the economy, this meant that a greater social cleavage existed and people started to raise awareness about the state of Portuguese life. And what happens is that public publishing ventures proliferate uh, non non-fiction and neo-realist fiction in prose start to disseminate and people start to think more about what life is like, is like in, Portu in Portugal. So, this means that if on the one hand there was a strong oppression and political censorship of publications on our radio and television um, broadcasts, on the other hand the 1930s were considered the golden age of children so this means that books written in this period fall into two distinct strands. First, we have the ones that went with the models of the regime and conveyed nationalist themes and the, and the values of God, homeland and family. And then we have authors that did not resign to the regime. And instead, they denunciated the situation by talking about freedom and by denunciation, denunciating what was happening in Portugal. So. Uh, the result is. <laughs> and despite the, the many numbers of books that we have in the scope, the word Pachegomes Ferreira stands out as being the first to bypass this Portuguese censorship in order to denunciate the situation of conformism and lack of opinion, opinion in a community that is anesthetized by fear. And this is what Cry and You Will Drink <laughs> was like. This is what the Portuguese society was like at the time. Surrounded by a wall, living in fear, with a whole world of adventure at its doorstep, but unable to take action. And so, uh, resigning to conformism. Uh, this was a community of people that gave up its heads, ideas, and opinions, and instead lived surrounded by crying, moss, sadness, and fear. Now, the result is a text that is both a social allegory, a political satire, and also uh, a cry against conformism. So when the book was, was published, it came with a subtitle of political conflict in the form of an awful. This talks about what the book was really about. It was a political conflict. It was in the form of a novel, so it was descriptive, descriptive and illustrative. So, but in its apparent naivety, it managed to go unnoticed by the regime. So it was published as a book in 1963. And who is our author? José Gomes is someone who acquires political awareness from an early age. He had military training and enlisted himself in the Republican Academic Battalion, has a law degree and is appoint appointed as Portuguese consul in Norway. His militancy and proximity to neorealism mark him as someone who seeks out to intervene and stimulate consciousness, casting a a critical eye into the world. Our author is also a father. He even dedicates this book to his two children. So he surely, as any parent, wants to give them a better life, away from the claws of the dictatorship. Also, he is marked by a feeling of remorse and responsibility of any lucid intellectual in a time of, uh, of dictatorship brutalities and injustice. So, this book opens a window to a uh, an urgent and necessary world, where real power is stronger than over years, working as an incitement to victory over fear. A world, a world in constant change, where 
Non-conformity is the great engine of a rebel leader. For freedom, constantly collides with the conservatism of spells and destiny. There are even times when the character challenges the own narrator. So this is the reflection of a Portugal that needs to be profoundly changed, shattering all the shackles that would limit creativity capacity of the imagination and an appeal for freedom of action. These adventures will be led by a hero who doesn't have any who doesn't have a determined age or features and who has a name that is well, John, that is the most common name in Portugal. So anyone can identify as as him. But this is a, a circular journey. And as Sunny pointed out, our adventure ends with the hero returning to its village and realizing the ineffectiveness of his revolutionary crisis. So instead he puts his practical mind to work and decides to open a Phoenix factory so I can dry the tears of the village, but at least I can provide tissues. <laughs> Uh, and what happens is that this is also uh, this is also this also turns out to be an allegory for what happens in Portuguese society, where people uh, and the citizens have a heavy conscience about what is happening and not having a proactive reaction about it. So that's remain about this hero's real potential for social innovation intervention, a reflection of the author's deep awareness of the reality and historical context of the dictatorship. But the novel ends with a phrase, ah, but one day, one day, projecting this into a promising future. Uh, okay, so uh, I, would, I would like to pose you a question. So, uh, what, what makes a book a good book? Why a book is a good book? What makes a book eternal? When we think about why, why, why is a book eternal? And there are a lot of reasons for sure for, for a book becomes eternal and for a book being a good book. And one of, one of the reasons for sure is that that book makes us feel some emotions. Okay, each book makes feel some emotions in the past, in the present, and to become eternal for people in the future as well. Uh, and Fears of Journey is one of such books. Okay, so it's not a book about. Uh, it's not a satire against the, the Portuguese dictatorship. This is a, a, a satire or a, a primal satire uh, uh, against or about human behavior. Okay, and so uh, the three of us we had a challenge to, to pose to ourselves and say. What about instead of seeing uh, a book set out against Portuguese dictatorship, let's see a book, let's read that book against Portuguese academia, okay, in the way they behave, in the way they, 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 they look at life. And what we have seen was that it was amazing, the result, and the next slide is precisely about that. So, uh, chapter four, chapter four, uh, Fearless John goes to a place where people, instead of their hair, they had some gramophones, and so it was quite amazed, so whoa, because it was people was really polite, they were talking about really all equally polite. But after a while, he, 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 he felt that the speech was always the same, always, always, always the same. Keep on saying the same. It was each day in, day out, they were saying the same. Okay, so young people, old people, ladies, gentlemen were always repeating the same. And even very old gramophones ask ask young gramophones for help. Okay, so can you twist the gram? Uh, the crank in order so that I keep on saying always the same bullshit, okay? And so, and, and, they, and they did like that. So let's let's jump to academia, okay? And in Portuguese academia, not only in Portuguese academia, we keep on saying the same old musty things, repeating always the same stuff, and we have blah blah. And even young people, even young people, when the old grumpy professors are are not there, they repeat the same thing. So the, they perpetuate the kind of speech. Okay, that the, the, the old professors kind of uh, uh, repeat. So it, it, it's, ah, it's, it's kind, of, kind of strange. Uh, what kind of speeches, for example? One that we all hear a lot. So, um, so, so uh, how do we say, so in English, so, um, we, so we, we said the people that uh, think that uh, it's possible to have practice without theory. And they always repeating this kind of this kind of same speech, and so and it's it's, it's a perpetuating of those speeches. But what about when uh, someone says something different? Okay, chapter eight. Okay. Chapter eight. It's uh, first of John goes to a place. It's upside down. So people walk on their on their hands. They say good night during the, the morning. They say good morning during the night. So they they wear a hat on their feet. So it's it's 
it, uh, completely the other way around. So, but uh, Fistless John goes and sees, oh, but there's, there's someone that there is walking with uh, his feet or her feet on the ground. What's happening? He asks, oh, what about those two guys over there? The clowns. They are clowns. They are kind of jokers. They are kind of a joke. So we don't, or we arrest them, or we don't pay much attention for them. Why? Because they are different. They, they look different, they say different things, so we don't, we don't pay much attention uh, uh, to them. So it, it was quite amazing. So, so, and then he went to, when he was alone, he said, oh, is not that uncomfortable to walk with the hands on, on, the, on the floor? Yes, it is. But at home, I walk with my feet down. But here, outside in the world, because I do what is expected from me. Okay, and so I walk with my, 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 my feet, uh, my, feet uh, uh, my, my hands on the ground. So. Let's go back to academia. When we, we say well, what is expected is from us to, to, to say, so that we, why? Because we want to keep the, the, our place in the university, we want to, to have a table, we want to have a share in the university, so we will say what is expected to say. And sometimes we say it so many often that we, like Ines was saying, so we, we became two different kind of us. Outside is equally, so we don't longer distinguish what, what, what we really believe. We believe what we are saying to the university, or we believe what we think at, at home. And so, the young rebel becomes the, 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 the mature man, and in the end becomes the old rebel form that's repeating the, the same things that was repeating ways before. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so this is chapter 9. So chapter 9, uh, a guy asks for help to Fistless John and says, Can you help me? Uh, because people do not listen to me. I, I don't know what what, what 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 must I do so so that people uh, listen to me. I can help you, says Fearless John. I can give you a new university, and you will see that people will start to listen. And suddenly he went to the town, and everybody was listening to him. And he was mute, but because he had a new university degree, so he, he kind of had a status and start to you know, people to listening to him. And so it was. A, Oh, God, Joel, but that's a, an ancient speech. It's still, it's still valid today. And we are so, yeah, if it's not important that university degree, why, why uh, a lot of us in the Twitter and the social networks, we put PhD in front of our name or professor in front of our name or whatever in front of our name, if it's not important? Because we feel that you, we will be uh, listen if we put that on in front of our name. And so we kind of perpetuate this because we, we really believe that people will look different for, uh, at us if we had a, some, some kind of a university uh, degree. Okay. And so, uh, so the, the book was from 1933. This academia, it was from 2022, like these two watches. So they uh, uh, look differently. They, they, they are differently. They smell differently, whatever. But they are kind of things filthy thing inside, so it's like of uh, us, so uh, we, the, the, the book, it was from 1933, I believe from 2022, we are different, different we look different, uh, we think differently, or at least we, we believe we think differently, but we behave exactly like the ones from 1933. I think you have many more examples there. Yeah, we, we the, could the, be all the, here all the, night. I remember in one, in, there is a fairy council. Old fairies and new fairies, and one of the fairies has recently moved out of the university, just finished her undergrad. And suddenly the old fairies turn to her and say, well, it's your turn to decide. But can you give me some advice? I don't know. Whatever you decide, it's on your shoulders. So that one of, that's one of the cases that I remember as an archaeologist, for example. The first excavation I did, I remember this supervisor told me, oh no, you're on your own. Just decide that. And suddenly, I remember this was all about the idea that, and this is interesting because if you look at, you don't know Portuguese culture that much, but there are there is a saying in Portugal that says, but some of us cry, some of us sell tissues. Yeah. And that's what this book was all inspired about. And there is a lot of other national things. But the, the interesting thing about this book, which unfortunately is not translated in other languages so except for Portuguese, is it is a satire to all the European society, all the European, because what we've talked about here, I quite believe that many of you recognize yourselves and the way that academia works. I don't know if you remember any, any, any episode that you want to talk about. Actually, there was this one episode with a prince that had ears like a donkey, like a donkey, and it was really ugly. And John comes up to him and he says, it's really ugly, and the prince is going on and on about his beauty. And he's very small in ears, and John is staying there like, oh, but you have monkey ears, you are so ugly. And he says that he talked to painters and 
sculptures and everyone, artists, so they can paint and sculpt and everything. And not a single one of them painted uh, a majestic face. Every portrait, every sculpture was ugly. And the person said, no, but I'm not ugly, ugly. The only thing they got right for like 20 years. Everyone got that right. And so John goes on a quest to find the truth at the bottom of the well. And what he finds are several wells with several truths. And so he comes back. Different facts. <laughs> different facts. And he comes back and he still thinks the prince is ugly. But the thing is, okay, the prince was ugly, but people thought he was ugly. People portrayed him as ugly. But the prince said, no, no, if you're, if you think I'm ugly, then you go to prison, so... <laughs> That's what you said. And there are other, there are several, so, so people that were, they, they lived on trees without doing nothing. And so at night, uh, uh, these guys, people that we do not see the face, come in night and so give food to the people that live on trees. And so, yeah, we can. So, so fortunately, it's not uh, uh, to generalize, but a lot of, uh, of professors so that students work for them. And so, but then suddenly their name disappears from the articles. So it's, it's a kind of. <laughs> so we, we can go on. Each, each line is a, is a, is a satire against, uh, or, or could be a satire against. Uh, the human behavior is